Thank you. Uh, uh, for the next, it has been a great date uh, so far. And for our next uh, uh, session, we have uh, 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 Julia Cauldron and Tanya Varela from UCLA. They are going to be our first speaker, uh, followed by Richard Kern and Vesna Roddick uh, from UC Berkeley. Uh, they'll be our second speaker, and then we have Tuba and Gwen uh, from UCLA. Uh, Lu On Lei from Hanoi National University of Education. And then we have Kwang Man Lei, Kwang Man Wu from uh, uh, NTT University, Vietnam. So I would like to invite uh, first Ulia Cauldron and Tanya Varela. Please go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. As was mentioned, uh, my name is Sonia Varela. I am a PhD candidate in the Spanish and Portuguese department. Um, and I've been teaching uh, Spanish language and culture courses in the department at UCLA since um, 2015. Um, and I will pass it on to Julia. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much, uh, day two. Uh, so I'm also a PhD candidate in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and I've also been uh, teaching in the department uh, since uh, 2017. Um, and our presentation today will be um, about our collaborative project we worked on last summer with the support of an EPIC land grant. Um, and specifically, the grant allowed us to design a project-based learning, uh, project-based learning projects and rubrics um, for advanced composition courses of heritage speakers of Spanish at UCLA. So we're gonna share um, what where that came from and um, what that ended up looking like. Um, so before delving into the actual projects, um, we want to go over some basic definitions. And that is what is a heritage, heritage learner, a heritage speaker, and what is a project-based learning approach. Um, although I know many of you are already familiar with, with those concepts. Um, uh, so I, you know, we brought a couple of definitions, one in a more broader sense, um, a heritage language, you know, forms part of a, parent's or a person's family's culture heritage um, and in different measures. They may have been exposed to the language at home and they um, don't necessarily have a functional proficiency in a language and would most likely need to study it as an L2 learner. Um, in terms of a more narrower definition, uh, Polinsky and Kagan offer um, the following, which is it, this heritage language was first in the order of acquisition it was not completely acquired because of the individual switch to another dominant language. So this situation, you know, speaking of California, happens very often with first, second generation students um, whose first language at home was Spanish and eventually because of their education ended up switching into English. Um, so it's important to understand that there's a considerable population in our language classrooms because as Julia and I have seen throughout our time teaching at UCLA, this forces a uh, reassessment of the pedagogical approach. It, it's not necessarily the same type of student that you're dealing with um, when you're teaching Spanish as a second language. Um, so what are the current course offerings that we have for these kinds of students at UCLA? Pass it on to Julia. Um, so right now the program is growing and we expect it to grow even more in the uh, following years. Uh, we don't have the exact number of heritage speakers of Spanish at UCLA in the undergrad population, but we know that we have a 21% of Hispanic students. So that's very likely that at least a good portion of them have uh, speak some Spanish at home and that we have also 31% of first-gen students, many of them not, uh, colliding with the Hispanic uh, population. Uh, so right now the Spanish and Portuguese department offers uh, a Spanish 7A, which uh, is elementary Spanish and in a quarter covers what would be three quarters of traditional Spanish. So the first uh, year of Spanish. Uh, and right now we have 
two sections that are almost full. Uh, so almost 50 students in this course are taking this class. Uh, then we have a Spanish 7B, which is intermediate, and this would be the equivalent of two uh, of uh, more quarters of Spanish, so the second year. And we have right now one section. Uh, and lastly, we have advanced composition, uh, no, which is a requirement. Uh, so Spanish 7A would be the language requirement for that is uh, required for most degrees uh, at UCLA. Uh, intermediate is uh, not a requirement, and advanced composition is a requirement to go into the uh, upper level, the major and the minor in Spanish. Uh, and right now we have two sections of that class, so it's also uh, going well. Uh, how these classes uh, offer us a few pedagogical challenges, no? and we notice that the textbooks and materials are uh, often problematic. I remember my first time teaching 7A, uh, first chapter there's a text talking about migration and it mentions illegal immigrants, so that's immediately a no for, for me. No, we have to work uh, around that. Uh, we have the issue of a specialized training, no, how to uh, teach these students. And uh, no, We're not going to uh, go through the uh, usual methods that with traditional students. And also on how to accommodate the variety, you know, the wide range of proficiency and needs of our students. So we'll have students who are uh, 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 very proficient in some uh, skills like listening and speaking, but they can barely write, no, their spelling is terrible, um, etc. Or uh, some of them are way more proficient orally, while others are not so much. Uh, so we have to accommodate all of that in one classroom. Uh, Tania. So, um... Project-based learning, um, so this is a student-centered approach in which, um, you know, students work over a period of time, and so in this case, we're talking about a quarter, an academic quarter, but it could be a semester or, um, you know, an academic year, um, and they work on a task or several tasks to, um, to tackle a problem and produce a product, create a product. Um, and so the advantages of using a project-based learning approach for heritage speakers, um, it, it focuses more um, specifically on the needs of heritage speakers. Um, it's no longer, you know, your traditional textbook where you let's start from the beginning and let's learn the numbers, which it's obvious for them or hello, goodbye, you know, like you really focus on developing a project that assesses their needs. Um, and as Julia mentioned, these needs can vary widely depending on the student. Um, it builds on what they already know. Um, so, you know, we're taking for granted that everyone has some knowledge from which they're starting off. Um, and it's also an opportunity for them to produce language that they can apply in real life. So usually these projects have some connection to a real life context and it would be something that they could do with Spanish, you know, in real life. Um, so it, it responds to their goals, motivations and lived experiences. And as I already mentioned, it responds to the wide diversity of learners that we have in heritage speakers classes. Um, sorry. Go ahead, I think. That's that's me. Okay. Um, so in terms of best practices for developing project uh, based learning. Um, so, you know, you give students a choice. It's not a task that they're forced on that they only have to do this and that's what they have to accomplish um, by the end of the class, but they have the opportunity to sort of develop their own learning experience. Um, we focus on a process and a product um, and we have a lot of input and output and input um, not only from the instructor, but also from their peers. And that's really important. Um, and that's something that we'll talk about in, how, in terms of how we developed our project. Um, and also output, we want students to give us everything they have and have many opportunities to do so. Um, not just, you know, standardized, um, in standardized ways within the, the language class. Um, it's content driven, um, so we want to provide students with as much as um, real life content as possible. 
Um, and we focus on developing um, vocabulary and grammar that is specific to a topic that is relevant to them. Um, we provide opportunities to students for students to think about how they're learning, why they're learning, the, the, the learning process, and um, providing formative assessment. So not just something at the end, but throughout the process so that they can understand um, what they're doing, how they're doing it, um, good or wrong, or how they can improve. Julia. Okay, so the projects are structured in the in this manner. It's going to be a group work uh, and scaffolded in step by step assignments. No, which we know reduces affective uh, filter and anxiety, offers the opportunity to uh, um, to receive feedback both by, both by peers and by the instructor. Uh, and we also uh, developed project specific rubrics. They all include class discussions and the projects are integrated into the uh, class uh, materials and the, the daily um, content. Uh, and all of them also uh, are finished with an oral presentation, either in groups or individual, depending on the project and a final written product. Uh, so we know that the advantages of uh, structuring this in this manner, that we're going to lower the anxiety, we're going to, um, uh, have more chances of having timely submissions with the scaffolding process, and that feedback is going to be taken into consideration no? because they're not just getting a grade at the very end, uh, but the opportunity to improve the grade throughout the process. Great. So, um, so before delving into the projects, um, I, you know, I, just a little bit of background. The department, um, Spanish and Portuguese, switched or started the transition into project-based learning, I wanna say in 2020 um, at the onset of the pandemic. And as you can imagine, it was quite chaotic at first trying to get anything done. I mean, just the fact that this is, you know, just shifting from a, to a different pedagogical approach is gonna be challenging in itself, doing it online and um, with everything that was going on was even more challenging. Um, so, you know, I, Julia and I have been involved in that process since the start, um, since 2020. And um, the way this transition started, it started with our elementary courses um, of Spanish. Um, before getting this grant last year to do the advanced composition courses, um, we had already been involved in developing um, the elementary project-based learning projects, um, yeah, PBL projects. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that foundation was, that first step, um, which is for the 7A, 7B, um, which as Julia mentioned, would be the elementary courses, which is equivalent to Spanish 1, 2, 3 um, currently at UCLA. Um, so they, they're all in Spanish, so I'm just going to go over the format real quick um, in English. Um, but this is an overview of what a typical project would be um, for a, a student starting off at 7A. Um, and so project one is a podcast. And um, so the product is that they have to create a podcast at the, uh, by the midterm. So the way we structured these courses is that they create two, they develop two projects per quarter. Um, so this would be the first one. And there's a general topic in this case is the Hispanic or Latin identity in context. And so it's a wide topic because from there, we want students to narrow it down. As I mentioned before, we want students to have a choice. We want students to come up with their own ideas. So the, the general topic is, is general, that's what it is. Um, so groups of two or three people, these are, for the most part, collaborative, because um, we want them, one, as to reduce the effective filter, one, to reduce the anxiety, um, and we want them to learn by collaborating, um, which is also, you know, a real life, um, real life situation, you learn by collaborating, uh, um, working together. Um, so in this case, the students need to create a podcast with elements or manifestations of Hispanic or Latin identity, um, so each team needs to pick a topic and the format. So this is completely up to them. Um, they need to develop, um, you know, the, 
the script. They need to share it with their peers and their professor to receive comments and review it uh, in the process. And then they have to record a podcast and upload it to Bruin Learn, where the rest of the class can listen to it. Um, and so everyone in the end needs to listen to each other's podcasts and comment on the podcast. So, you know, that uh, until the end, there is this sense of um, working with, with everyone else and giving feedback to each other. Um, we do provide some examples of topics that they could choose. They don't have to choose these, but just to give them an idea of this is something you could come up with. Um, so first generation students at UCLA, the best taco trucks in Los Angeles, or the Day of the Dead. Um, and so we um, establish project components, um, you which, minutes. you know, in this case, you know, we have, we, we need to have this um, name and description script, um, the podcast and their reactions, which is, you know, basically what they're graded upon. Um, so in, ter in terms of the, the organization, we have the description and we also provide the students with a calendar that breaks it down week by week um, that shows what they have to do in class, what they have to do out of the class, what they have to turn in on Bruin Learn. Um, and, and so that's in terms of a sample project for 7A. And uh, real quickly, you know, we also have um, like a, a journalistic article that they also have to present. Um, they have an ebook and the end uh, academic research. So the idea is also that these projects evolve in complexity um, and that they build upon each other so that in the end, you know, they can um, they can reach that level uh, from elementary to more advanced. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Julia so she can talk about the Spanish 27, which is the advanced composition classes. Uh, so for Spanish 27, we wanted to integrate uh, skills that help uh, students in the upper division, no? where they're going to be doing literary analysis and uh, writing papers for, for professors. So we're going to uh, have a, a, few, a few projects. Uh, the first one uh, is a uh, um, movie festival, a short film festival based on uh, films that are based on migration. Um, journalistic um, uh, profile and uh, then for the so instructors can choose one or the other for the first one first uh, five weeks and then in the second five weeks of the quarter they would choose between a personal essay uh, which is based in meaningful literacy instruction so students are writing um, a linguistic uh, autobiography or an academic essay uh, so we also prepared a mini lesson plan on how to write a thesis statement. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, support instructors in teaching students how to employ secondary sources, how to look them up and how to quote and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the first one is just this um, uh, journalistic profile in which students would uh, interview a migrant, you not know, go through all the process of preparing the questions, doing the interview, uh, and doing final presentation about it, and editing the interview. Uh, next slide. Uh, you have two minutes, please summarize. Thank you. Good. Uh, so next slide, I'm going to skip this one. And... Uh, yeah, I'm uh, and here we have, uh, so the students are given a sample peer, uh, peer review uh, with gui a question guiding them, no? because often we give students the papers and they don't know what to do with them, they just correct typos, so here is very specific things that they can focus on uh, to offer feedback to their partner, no? enriching and constructive feedback. Um, next slide. And here is the rubric for the uh, oral presentation so that the students also know exactly what makes a very good presentation based on the content, the quality presentation, or the, uh, the performative uh, part of it, and then also the linguistic uh, portion of it, grammar and syntax, as well as vocabulary and intonation and, um, and voice. Uh, 
That's it. And finally, for my last minute, I believe, uh, instructors can contribute and improve projects uh, by doing daily work on the projects in class, not so integrating the contents in the uh, work that they do, in the class discussions, you know, uh, implementing the peer reviews, uh, using materials that are related to the project's topics, uh, uh, implementing writing activities uh, on a daily basis in the classroom, for example, doing a free writing as a warm up, it's an excellent way, uh, offering always feedback to students in each step of the process, and creating mini lesson plans that are fitted to the projects and that they can uh, do throughout the quarter. And uh, that was uh, that was it. Thank you everyone for your time. We expect your, your questions at the end of the, of the panel. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. That was right on time. You still have 10 seconds left. Very nice. And I'm sure we'll have a, a lot of questions because this was a very informative and uh, creative uh, uh, pr presentation. Without uh, uh, delay, I would like to call our uh, next presenter, Professor Richard Kern and Vesna Roddick from UC Berkeley. And the topic of their presentation is the role of discovery, pedagogy in building agency and community in language learners. Please take the floor. Great, Thank thanks. Uh, we've got some slides here. Uh, Vesna, are you able to put the slides up? I'm going to start sharing right now. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Rick Kern. I'm the chair of the French department at Berkeley and Vesna Radic uh, is our language program director. And together, uh, Vesna and I have been involved for the last few years in UC Berkeley's discovery initiative. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing uh, during that time is running a program of discovery fellows for instructors of languages, as well as reading and composition uh, on the Berkeley campus. Uh, so what we'll be presenting today is a redesigned version of French 102, uh, which is a fifth semester a required course that serves as a gateway to our upper division coursework. Uh, the redesign incorporates what we call a discovery based pedagogy in line with the Berkeley uh, discovery initiative. And the goal is to help students develop their advanced language skills while also fostering a sense of belonging, cultivating students curiosity and encouraging learners to apply their knowledge and build their sense of agency. So starting from the theme of an environmental crisis in French Guiana, uh, Vesna is going to show us uh, the, the, the course that she's developed that gets students engaged in research, analyzing a variety of primary sources, uh, be it texts or films or maps, and immersing themselves in a comparative and critical study of different moments in cultural history and how they relate this analysis to contemporary contexts. I'll talk a bit about the general discovery initiative on the Berkeley campus, uh, and then Vesna, uh, who is the one who redesigned this French 102 course, as well as prior intermediate level courses, will demonstrate how a discovery-based pedagogy allows students to build their analytical skills while simultaneously fostering their creativity and strengthening their sense of community through a focus on collaboration and inclusion. So just to say a, a few words about the UC Berkeley Discovery Initiative. Um, this is a uh, initiative that's, that, that goes way back, but in recent years, uh, it's been um, uh, part of a, of a grant program that has encouraged departments to innovate um, in discovery projects. Uh, and so our department is one uh, that has been participating in this. So. Uh, the way that discovery is a little bit different, uh, it's, it's more than a single uh, experience in a class or a one semester uh, capstone project. It's, it's rather in, uh, an arc that supports undergraduates on a journey of engaging creatively with their education in the world over uh, their undergraduate time, and as I'll mention later, actually over their, their lifetime in the sense of continued learning after uh, the university. So in this slide here, we see the connect phase, uh, where the emphasis is on giving students a sense of belonging, uh, encouraging a culture of personal agency. This is particularly important in our project, since we work largely with undergraduates in the first two years many of whom are first-generation college students. 
That moves on to the immerse phase where students are exposed to inquiry driven, driven learning and engaged learning in communities. So Vesna will give you concrete examples of this when she talks about the French 102 curriculum. In the culminate phase, students apply and express their knowledge and passion through a personalized discovery experience, whether through original, original research or artistic production or entrepreneurial initiatives or community engaged service. As I mentioned earlier, discovery has multiple scales. So while we'll be talking today about a particular course, discovery is also about an undergraduate's whole experience and ultimately is intended to instill a lifelong ethos of being curious, of engaging with challenges and fostering creativity and innovation. So on the next slide, uh, we have the goals of discovery in the French language classroom. And these are to engage students in a discovery experience of culture where they're actually doing their own research. Uh, and that involves working with primary sources, the second point on the slide. Uh, and often times students are not clear on the distinction between primary sources and secondary sources. And so that's something that we work on with them. Uh, the third point is offering an inquiry based approach to the research process. So this involves working with students in cycles of observing, interpreting their observations, and then developing questions based on their interpretations, the things that they uh, still are curious about, things that, that uh, are, are evoked by what they have observed and interpreted. And then finally, including experiential learning in order to expose learners to contexts that create an insider's perspective. So now uh, I'll turn to Vesna, who will go into the heart of French uh, uh, 102. Thank you so much, Rick. And um, I hope you can still see my slides as I move through them. So as Rick mentioned, we have incorporated elements of the discovery approach in our language courses through different modules. And we have designed an entire course, um, French 102, which is named uh, Advanced Reading and Writing Workshop. Um, uh, and it's our fifth semester course in the language sequence. So we go French one, two, three, four, and then 102. It's a gateway course into the upper division and um, where students work on their written skills uh, in French, uh, paying more uh, attention to things like stylistics, um, rhetoric, and uh, they continue to de develop their analytical and critical skills. So today we'll show how this entire course has adopted the discovery-based approach and has helped students um, both develop their individual sense of agency as well as build community. Um, the learning objectives of this level, as I said, are the continued work on critical and analytical skills through a study of variety of genres, which can be both literary and non-literary, and also one of the goals is as they develop their um, critical skills and their language skills at the advanced level to practice distinguishing between primary and secondary sources um, and as they engage in research. So for our pilot, we themed an entire uh, course of uh, French 102 um, around environmental sustainability and have used a variety of primary sources that included different genres within um, literary works. Um, as well as legal documents, uh, in particular, France's Charter on the Environment and the, the Paris Climate Accord. We also used maps and um, focused on studying a film. Uh, this was supplemented with uh, experiential learning sites on campus that students visited, um, sort of observing and reporting back on various sustainable practices throughout the semester, and students engaged in research um, activities both through the UC Berkeley campus library da databases. They also use the Library of Congress, which is one of the early partners on our discovery project, and they conducted uh, research online. Um, so in this pilot, in, in the course, uh, we first asked students, I'll focus on um, sort of the relevant parts as, as to how we got to the study of this one 
francophone context in um, the French Guiana. Our students studied the Francis Charter on the Environment, uh, which is a document that was drafted in 2004 and that was added to the French constitution. It was um, the first one of its kind. Um, and then we also engaged in a detailed analysis of the Paris Accord on Climate. Um, so uh, students first uh, researched information on um, the Charter and the Environment. And um, we also read the, the Paris Accord in, in great detail, detail in the class, engaging close reading of its articles, considering its form as a legal document, and um, students reported that when uh, their research assignment was to research any information on the Charter on the Environment in France, and also look up information about implications of the Paris Climate Accord in countries that are its signatories in the contemporary context. So these examples on the screen uh, show some student work that was reported back on our course Canvas page in a discussions thread. Uh, where students were able to enter in a dialogue with one another based on their findings. And, um, you know, they shared resources. You have 10 minutes. Implementation of the ideas from the Paris Accord in Canada, Mexico, Nicaragua, Germany, the UK, China, and other countries. Um, they consider specific applications of these ideas and the unique position of the US who first signed and then withdrew from the accord and so on. And so what we notice in the student feedback here as they discussed over the course of several days on discussion threads is a excitement about two things in particular. One is the work on contemporary topics which students were particularly excited about. And the other one is the opportunity to share their ideas and findings on an ongoing basis in an engaged way with their peers. So this expanded the context for the reflection on the ideas present in these texts, these legal documents. And also this was the moment where we launched a student's comparative and cross-cultural thinking as they looked up different resources. Um, and then we moved to the study of related environmental questions in yet another contemporary context, which is the French Guian, which although it's located in South America, holds a specific relationship to France today as one of its overseas territories. Um, now, this cultural context is largely unknown to our students. So we started off by identifying some key dates in its history of its connection with France, including its colonization by France in the early 17th century, its abolition of slavery in 1848, um, its transformation into France's penal colony in 1852, where a famous prisoner um, stayed at the end of the 19th century, Alfred Dreyfus, during the Dreyfus Affair in France. And finally, its transformation into today's status of an overseas territory in 1946. Then, um, once students learned about the, this basic timeline, we started exploring um, sources and cultural contexts in relation to specific points from the timeline. So one of those sources is this map. I'm not sure if you can see its full title, uh, but the map dating from the end of 16th century is called the New Map of the Wonderful, Large, and Rich Land of Guiana. And it was actually produced by a Dutch cartographer because the Dutch had a presence in, um, in that area and, and what is today Suriname. So uh, we studied several early modern maps, including this one, uh, we discussed its title, its positioning in light of the colonial project, and the decolonization of the curriculum, by the way, is one of the chief goals of our program. We used um, resources from the Library of Congress, uh, where students moved through three distinct steps um, analyzing the, the map. So they, I'll show you an example here, and this is a primary source analysis tool for analyzing maps that the Library of Congress uh, has given us and has allowed us to translate it into French for dissemination. So students are asked to observe what they see, reflect on its meaning, and then list questions that they have about this primary source. So this is just one example of students' organization of map analysis through these steps. And students were further asked what they would like to know more about this source and how they would go about finding that information. 
So students' comments um, here showed really the reflection on the colonial gaze represented in the map. There, there is a representation of a headless figure in the map, um, and a note in writing saying cannibals and so on. So they had a lot of questions about that. And then we further also um, had students explore another year in cultural history that was relevant for the study of this context, which is 1848. This was the year that slavery was abolished in French Guiana, but also the year of a revolution in France, and also the year when the gold rush started in California. Uh, so for this, we used the app Padlet, which is particularly convenient for depositing materials including visuals, uh, videos, um, paintings, as you can see, hopefully here on the screen, um, a painting of famous historical figures that marked the launching of the revolution of 1848. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, also text comments, including student comments, uh, can be showcased in this way. And there are several backdrops, including this one with the world map, which made this particularly interactive for our students. This was another opportunity for students to research, uh, collect results, and share them with the group. And this served as both a thematic and contextual preparation for the study of related questions. Found five field. minutes. So we focused on this documentary. As you can see, students uploaded information about um, Guyan videos about the start of the gold rush, because the film that we focused on um, deals with uh, gold extraction in uh, French Guyan. And it's a documentary on the native um, tribes living in the Amazonia, the Wayanas, and um, their struggle with about 10,000 illegal gold seekers who hide in the forests um, where um, the mercury contamination, because mercury is used to extract gold, has created a lot of environmental and health catastrophes. And so this documentary showcases the struggle of the Voyana with these uh, destructions brought about by, by gold mining and um, several human rights violations. Mm -hmm. Um, in it. So uh, as we got to the study of this doc documentary, we also asked students to view the film and then fill out the primary source analysis tool through these steps, observe, reflect, question. And so students had a lot of questions. They wanted to know if the Wayana tribe continued to drink this mercury contaminated water today, what the French government is currently doing about this problem, um, how the Wayana live now, what are the difficulties obtaining French paperwork documents since this is a French territory, but the, the documentary showcases those challenges in getting papers. Um, and this was an impressive uh, depth and range of involvement with the key themes of the film both thematically and formally, having gone through the previous steps of analysis. And finally, our work involved on a written assessment on the final exam, where we asked students um, to reflect on um, the nature of two genres, at least, at least that we've studied, and how they um, represent <clears throat> the theme uh, of the environment. And these questions that are cultural, political, and linguistic, um, if there is a particularly suitable form for doing so. And so the, the comment in blue shows um, a response by one of the students who said the film has the capacity to humanize the associated parties within the problem. And in my opinion, the most important aspect in resolving the problem is empathy. When we can understand the similarities that we share with another person, we feel more obliged to help them. And indeed, students felt this urge to get involved. They further researched about current environmental agencies um, that can be uh, found in this area. They felt a sense of urgency and call for action and um, uh, uh, recognized the film's ability to, to account for multiple perspectives while at the same time commenting on the issues of objectiveness of a documentary, um, a director's choices, and so on. So to conclude, our students um, enhanced their collaborative work through Canvas, through inquiry work with primary sources, um, they uh, two minutes on the context um, critically and comparatively. They were trained in the research process rather than focusing on the end product, something like a paper. They uh, practice distinguishing between different sources 
and were sensitized to different student genres. And they uh, demonstrated increased sense of engagement and agency. As you'll see these two, two comments at the end in blue uh, and the course evaluations, one student said, as an English major, I constantly have to look at materials and inquire into their greater meaning. The essays we wrote for this class helped me enrich my skills to analyze sources in any language or medium. And then the second quote, the process of generating questions by the primary sources led me to consider texts and other media more critically, paying closer attention to the goals that motivated and influenced the form and structure of a primary source. Asking questions about a primary source has certain, char uh, uh, has certain characteristics, has prompted me to look beyond the content of a document and consider conscious choices, omissions, and rhetorical strategies that contributed to its creation. So we'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, and I must say that uh, when I heard you talking about the decolonization of the curriculum, that was my wow moment of, of the presentation. Uh, yeah, because in, in, in morning we were talking about uh, that an author did not differentiate between people from Africa and people from India, and now we're talking about decolonizing the curriculum. So very nice. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for this uh, uh, detailed presentation. Uh, our next speaker uh, is my dear colleague, Puba uh, from UCLA, uh, uh, and along with our colleagues from- uh, Hanoi University. Um, Hanoi, and... Hanoi University of Education, uh, Professor yeah, Lu and... Hon Lei and Professor Kong Man Wu from uh, NTT University uh, from Saigon, from, uh, Saigon yeah, the Saigon. South of Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, cool. And the, the, the title of their presentation is Collaboration and Actualization in Higher uh, Language Education. They're going to talk about AI using AI in the classroom. So yeah, mm -hmm. let's go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Faraz. Um, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, going to take some uh, minute to share my, uh, can I share my um, PowerPoint? So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share um, our um, uh, experience uh, of uh, language teaching um, in this conference. And um, I am Thu Ba Nguyen. Uh, teacher at UCLA, and uh, I uh, um, co-author uh, this paper with uh, Wang Le, um, my colleagues from Hanoi Education University, and uh, Mạnh Quang Vũ from uh, Nguyễn Tất Thành University from uh, Saigon. So um, we uh, come up with uh, a lot of idea, but uh, I know that uh, <laughs> we don't have any time, so I will uh, Go <laughs> fast. Uh -huh. So my uh, our uh, presentation is now. Uh, let me okay. Um, right. <laughs> okay. So uh, our presentation is collaboration and actualization in higher language education. Um. So uh, as uh, uh, you can see on of the picture uh, in my um, uh, screen, that's uh, how my student, uh, our student uh, collaboration and you know practice their language. So um, in this presentation, we will focus on two questions. The first is how AI benefits my student and I. And the second question, it's the main um, uh, idea of the presentation is how have my classroom benefit student in this AI era? Um, and um, of course, we uh, we have a lot of things to benefit our student, but I just would like to focus on two uh, important concepts that focus on promoting student central learning and empowering students to take active role in their own learn learning, uh, language learning process. That's it, actualization and collaboration. 
So how has AI benefits my student and I? Mm, so um, um, AI has the potential, uh, potential of uh, provide a huge amount of information quickly and efficiently. AI too offers significant opportunity to enhance language learning by acting as a powerful tutor. Uh, I mean, a virtual tutor provide the answer uh, kind of like uh, ask me anything. Um, that's uh, I learned from my colleague, my um, dear colleague, uh, Dr. Mahajan, that ask me anything. And I found that my student like more um, confident to ask, you know, like AL more than me, <laughs> of course. So uh, my first uh, homework uh, for the first homework, teamwork for my introductory Vietnamese uh, introductory at UCLA is use AL to construct five minute lecture to teach our language, to teach our class how to practice Vietnamese flat tone in um, and pronounce ID Canada, MD Canada, Toy D Canada. As I know that the flat tone in Vietnamese language is it's the most important and uh, basic for uh, you know, like foreign language learner. And uh, amazing that my student provide an uh, amazing lecture, you know, five minute lecture to teach uh, the entire class how uh, to pronounce the flat tone and how to pronounce uh, those sentences using AL. And of course, actually, um, I believe that all of us can uh, read right here. Um, I believe that uh, we can just put into uh, VI is me and how the um, chat PTD answer. Is it perfect? Is it perfect? And uh, my student was able to present their lecture in five minutes uh, with AL health. And, um, and we present that we learn it from AI. And not only the pronunciation, um, the AI can help with everything. Uh, as you know, uh, ask me anything, right? So um, another homework I uh, give my student is, is explain the impression uh, of the idiom nói thì dễ làm thì khó right here in uh, IL answer and create five more sentences using the same structure and of course my student come up with um, very you know like very meaningful answer uh, and so uh, is very the question for us. So do we need to fit our student information? Maybe uh, less. We do not, we not need to fit our student the information. In this, we give students the problem solving skill and allow them to think of their own uh, responses and interpretation of information. So students should able to have a voice and envision a better world with the information presented. As you will see right here, some of uh, example um, I asked my student to do. Uh, it just start from this year that uh, well uh, discuss the eleven vowel in Vietnamese was. The vowel give you the most difficult thing to uh, difficult time to practice, uh, or discuss about Vietnamese personal pronoun is, uh, you know, the most in, uh, very um, complicated thing, or some like social um, issue like discuss uh, should we keep the Lunar New Year 
or switch to solar New Year days uh, like Japan and um, you know uh, Japanese they switch from uh, Lunar New Year to just to celebrate Solar New Year. But why Vietnamese still keep it? And what do you think about that? So I cannot do it without AI because AI can help my student you know, like provide and answer their question right away. But um, also have the AI can help students to practice argumentation and also critical thinking skill as well. Look at that. I mean, not everything that AI can, you know, provide the right Question, the right answer. Like right here, I asked my student to um, present um, the meaning of some idiom. It's right. But some other, it's not right. So uh, I use this to help my student to develop the skill to uh, differentiate this between good and bad reserve when they research online. So now um, I'm going to go to the second question. How have my classroom benefit student in this AL era? So um, as uh, everyone will know, student can research, uh, especially higher education, student can research, can, uh, you know, uh, like um, uh, um, achieve, their own uh, knowledge by themselves. So, so what my job and our job, our uh, university educator, so I uh, recognize that our work is to assist students to master their knowledge and to be able to practice and apply their knowledge into reality, actuality. We have 10 minutes left. Yes. So we move from being a lecturer to the role of support and coaching, um, coordinate group activity in the language class. So we become a companion with students to access knowledge together. And right here, uh, what we can do. Two things we can do, that's the first thing is actualization. We help our students to apply the knowledge of the, um, the knowledge to enjoy the uh, culture, the music, the movie, and the story. Uh, we help our students to apply their knowledge to express their own story. Um, using the uh, phenomena, the target language culture with the type of frame we teach them, they can um, present themselves, present their own story. And um, not only their personality, but also their culture and also some kind of, you know, like, like a social uh, issue. And the actualization, we apply, we help our students to apply the knowledge to express their own idea. We can help them to practice and, um, you know, like a critical thinking skill. Now, making important thing, I think, and uh, my student enjoyed it the most, that's it. Our classroom help my student, our student to making the connections to the local target language community. Uh, in this case, it's Vietnamese language community in LA and the community in the target language, in the language culture, like uh, in Vietnam. So uh, here I would like to share with you the picture uh, we just uh, took uh, on the Thursday, the April 27, there's um, uh, I call the pictures called the Earths. Um, that is, you know, the picture between our Vietnamese course with uh, some of, you know, like a pre presenter of Vietnamese community in LA and a lot of Vietnamese students in Vietnam. 
So um, that is, you know, like uh, the spy, um, the pride for our class. Also for collaboration, we work to pair work, group work, final project. They can work together. They can practice communication skill and learn from each other. So students can practice and present their own talents. And uh, this student uh, present uh, his um, martial art. Uh, those students present their own music. And by practicing collaboration in a language class, students can improve their communication skill and build confidence in using language and learning. So here is some student, uh, they group together, they go to uh, uh, Sotea. Maybe everyone know about that in the West LA to enjoy the restaurant, enjoy uh, the food. And uh, this group is uh, building um, a, like drum vlog to Vietnam. <laughs> so you can guess right here, uh, this student played the role of drum, how to drum to uh, explore Vietnam. So not limit on, you know, like uh, teamwork, uh, per feedback and collaboration writing, collaborative writing. Uh, I found that collaborating writing is, is so useful, help students work together to write a story together and help them practice grammar, vocabulary and sentence structure. And again, um, to, uh, uh, to collusion, uh, while AL and technology are really advancing, uh, language classroom are no more only the source for students to achieve knowledge. I recognize that because our students can achieve knowledge about Vietnamese language and culture everywhere, about our you know our mm, uh, content everywhere, but rather. Our classroom need to provide the positive environment where our students are encouraged to communicate, collaborate, and apply their knowledge into real life. You have and, five minutes. Uh, yes, uh, the last sentence. And how about us? <laughs> our we teacher, we are no longer a transmitter of knowledge. But we become an uh, inspiration to teacher, to students, um, become a role of support and coaching and helping our students to develop useful competence. And also, we actually play is, you know, play a role of the guide, <laughs> the guide. The two guy, I mean, student guy using AL to uh, coordinating group activity. So this is um, uh, the important that uh, nowadays AL uh, error. So what our class can do for our student and what uh, our, we are still a uh, teacher can provide our student. So um, thank you so much for um, giving me and my colleague the opportunity to present um, our idea. And here is some uh, reference uh, I based on to build my presentation. And uh, finally, cảm ơn. thank you. <sighs> thank you, Professor Tuba. It was a very nice presentation. Hope uh, we have learned uh, so much and we'll be incorporating AI into our classroom. Uh, <laughs> now we open the floor uh, for questions. All right, uh, anyone who would like to go first? All right, while you can think about your question and maybe uh, take your time, write it somewhere and then raise your hand if you would like to ask a question later. I would like to uh, 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 like say something about my experiences of how uh, it has been for in the last two days. It has been a great learning experience. And especially when, we, when I hear people uh, talking about 
uh, project-based learning, having podcast, creating podcast in the classroom, uh, and at like uh, uh, elementary level, and then we have uh, people talking about uh, climate change, uh, gold rush in California, analyzing film, and uh, post uh, decolonizing the curriculum using AI. It is just a phenomenal uh, range of uh, things that we are doing in our classroom. As Professor Mahajan Mai Guruji uh, always says, that we are not language teachers. We are like lang we are uh, the uh, ambassadors of language humanities. So, and uh, sometimes I, I hear uh, the people say that we are lecturer, we are language teachers, we are not content teachers. I don't know what content can be. Hey, this is not what content is. We are teaching the history of, uh, of, of Gold Rush and how it has affected the Amazonia. And now we are talking about using AI. So brilliant, it's, it's amazing. And then we have a question in the chat box. Uh, I, I am you if you would like to direct this to somebody. Uh, it says, uh, is there any difference in the way of citing primary sources between the target language and English? If so, how uh, did you guide the students? So I'm I, not I sure. imagine that's for uh, the French uh, presentation. Um, um, yeah, I mean, there, even within English, there are multiple uh, citation standards. Uh, and so what we do is work with uh, um, students to alert them to the need for attending to the standards that are called for in, you know, because they might be different, uh, submitting it uh, on a website versus in an academic paper. Uh, there may be different standards and different formats and so forth. So we sensitize them to the fact that uh, if they are going to be publishing something, uh, then they need to, you know, look into what standards are called for. Uh, and for our class, uh, we just use um, basically the same standards as we would use, like for the MLA conventions, you know, uh, same information, um, but just citing the French uh, source if it is a French source. Uh, the Spanish teacher, would you like to comment on this? Uh, sure. Um, so, sorry for the, any background noise. Uh, so we, um, uh, we tell instructors that they can, uh, or instructors say that they can use whatever, uh, citation method they prefer, but, uh, most professors in our department in the upper division will go for the MLA. So we try to push, uh, that, and then we just, uh, teach them how to format the paper, how to do the work cited section and how to do index citations and all of that, and just how to keep coherence. You no, know, we try to um, reinforce a lot the idea that whatever method you choose for citations, APA, uh, MLA, whatever, just uh, be consistent throughout your work. And uh, in general, things are uh, pretty good with, uh, with it. It's not a, a big deal. Thank you, Julia. We have another question uh, from uh, Michelle Smith. Uh, this is for all the presenters. How do you grade students' work uh, as an in completion based? Um, so, uh, uh, if uh, yeah, I will just uh, uh, how I grade my student. That's a lot of work. <laughs> So I did present to uh, Dr. Ganam uh, Hazan, that's it, a lot of work. So how we pray our student, we need to have the rubric. And um, I build that rubric uh, over the time, uh, like a couple of years and, uh, and, you know, like uh, completed uh, day by day. And I'm share that rubric with my uh, TA and uh, grader. And also I work with my student about that rubric as well. That's mean before I'm go uh like when I give them the um, uh present them the uh, the exam, I will present them my rubric and go with my student very specific what we need to do and what you do will take will get score. What do what will get uh minus get deduction. So um uh, so the rubric it take a long and a lot of 
uh, yeah, time consuming work as well uh, to build it and uh, we build it day by day, time by time, uh, and we complete it uh, time by time. So, um, so that's it uh, for my uh, uh, situation. I don't know about French and Spanish. I would like to learn that uh, how you guys, you know, <laughs> to um, to do the proofreads. I mean, like to create our students in a fair ways. I'll, I'll just say in French that it, it depends on the goals uh, of the particular uh, oh. activity. So there are some things uh, the simplest and most mechanical things may be completion based, um, but then um, if we are interested in um, their ability to do a particular task, then it may be, you know, mm -hmm. the criteria may be, you know, associated with the task and the, and the wow. elements in the task. On, on essay writing, we take into account the organization uh, of the essay, the ideas that have been developed, how well those ideas have been supported uh, mm -hmm. with examples, uh, and then look at the language uh, itself in terms of the, you know, the, the uh, grammar, spelling, mm -hmm. mechanics, and so forth. But those, those are sort of the last things that we take into account. Yeah. Well, that's it, uh, background. I, I mean, uh, background work, but very important. Right, because students need to. Um, I mean, in my presentation, I say about like a collaboration and actualization, but I recognize that the important thing is audible how to call our student work. That's it, important, but that's it in another story, another present can be another, you know, like uh, thing. Uh, but uh, I think uh, to build a proofread. Uh, it's important, right? Like your student, uh, how you help them with uh, like certain kind of like uh, connection, certain kind of like preposition. I mean, like you know, there's kind of like um, uh, yeah, uh, linguistic uh, issue. Yeah. Right. Uh, Thoba, we have another question for you, and uh, the yeah. question is: Could you tell us more about how sometimes? AI provided wrong answers and how you turn such occasions into teaching opportunities. Oh, um, thank you so much for, for this uh, question. Uh, you Lee, uh, um, because uh, actually um, I would like to present this a lot, but because of the time consuming. So I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I would like to share um, uh, some of my, uh, uh, presenting, I have uh, right here. So that's why uh, people say, oh, AI is going to free us a lot of time to uh, do other stuff. No, I mean, as for now, not yes. And uh, not free time, yes, because I need to learn about that. I need to read them, research them. And then, basing on that, I give my student the uh, um, um, Homework, like for example, some homework I give them, uh, like right here. So AI answer the right answer. Uh huh. But uh, uh, when before I um, I, I require my student the homework. I need to research first. Like for example, in these sentences, um, the AI doesn't provide the right answer at all, and um. And actually, it's helped me to, you know, like to help my student to develop the skill of differentiate between good and bad answer. So actually, that's good as well. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Thuba. Uh, the, that it was a nice presentation. Professor Mahajan has been very patient with oh. her hand raised for a long time. We have five minutes and we don't have any more <laughs> questions. So Guruji, the floor is all yours. No, I um, I like going last because I just have only good things to say. And uh, I really appreciated uh, everyone's presentation. Um, the first thing is all papers presented some concrete examples and a way to uh, emulate uh, the pedagogical innovations that you are doing. 
Um, and the second thing for me is uh, uh, this, uh, especially, uh, actually all of you were addressing uh, the theme of the conference to do with student empowerment. And each one of you was, you know, even using words like discovery or collaboration or leaving it up to uh, the students. And, um, you know, as you were saying, uh, Tuba, that we are simply facilitators. And so being able to uh, provide some uh, ownership in their learning to the students directly and students empowering them uh, is, I guess, the goal of um, well, goal of our conference and beyond that, the goal of uh, language teaching in our global classroom. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I would love to, by the way, I would like to say thank you to APIC, uh, EPIC to uh, give us the um, opportunity to present our um, uh, experience uh, and I can uh, collaborate <laughs> again, collaborate me and my colleague in Vietnam, or oh, I believe that's like uh, you and your colleague in uh, the uh, target language. So um, uh, we can collaborate together and can um, find the best uh, way to, um, I mean, like to, uh, how to say, to um, to serve our student uh, with the buffet. Like yesterday, I remember uh, Dr. Ganam Hazan say that like we provide our student the buffet and then they will um, choose their ways, <laughs> uh, their tests to to make their own food. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think uh, since we don't have any other question, any we still have two minutes. Anyone would like to give any last comment uh, before we conclude and go for a break? All right. So it looks like we have we've done well. And uh, thank you so much to all the presenters. Mm -hmm. It was a great opportunity to host you uh, and invite you to present for us. Thank you, and uh, you have a good day ahead. <laughs>